Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about physical fitness and what you need to do in order to stay healthy. My guest today is Ayla Donlin. Ayla is the Director of the Life Fit Center at the Beach mm -hmm. and she is also a faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology. Welcome Ayla and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thanks Dave, my pleasure. Before we start on our main subject, which mm -hmm. is physical fitness, health, and wellness, and the mm -hmm. holistic approach, I want to give you an opportunity to say a few words about the Life Fit Center. What is the Life Fit Center, mm -hmm. and what do people do there? Yeah. The Life Fit Center is a health and fitness facility on campus. We're located in the Kinesiology Building, and we cater to campus members and community members who are age 50 and above. So all of our programs and services are tailored to those who are age 50 and above. We're also an educational lab for the College of Health and Human Services. We host academic courses inside of our facility, and we offer internship opportunities for students in the college each semester as well. So you offer a full range of programming and exercise facilities? We do. We offer group fitness programming, which is probably our most popular programming. We offer personal fitness training that folks can work with a personal trainer who not only has a degree in kinesiology but has a nationally recognized certification. And we offer different assessment services as well. Folks can get a fitness assessment, a balance assessment. We have a body composition analysis machine called the BOD pod that individuals can come in and, and get assessed. And we offer all kinds of educational, social programming, and informational programming on different health and wellness topics. At least once a month, usually two or three times a month, we host those types of workshops. Well, let's get started on our main topic here, which is physical fitness mm -hmm. and its correlation with overall health and wellness. Mm -hmm. Because I think we can agree in today's world that we need a balanced approach, we need a holistic approach as is the popular phrase today. What is that holistic approach? Yeah, I like to think of it as four different segments or kind of the four legs of a table or four legs of a chair and filling each of those so that you're in a well-balanced state. So I, I think the physical aspect is a huge piece of it. And then the mental aspect, the social aspect, and the spiritual aspect. And those can all be very intertwined as far as our physical movement meeting our mental, social, and spiritual needs as well. So I think it's that holistic approach to fitness and health that really brings things together. Okay, and let's take mm -hmm. a look at the physical fitness side of it. Mm -hmm. And that does involve the movement. Yep. What's the most important concern for people as they get started into a physical fitness program? And I know you're going to tell me that a lot of people take on too much too soon and then get burned out. Yes, that's a common phenomenon. That's why you see folks join in January with their New Year's resolutions and then by March the gym is quiet again and it's back to the, to the loyal and dedicated few. Um, the, the key to getting started is to think big but start small and make a plan for yourself but gradually increase. You want to gradually increase the frequency of your exercise, gradually increase the intensity, and then gradually increase the diversity in the different types of exercises that you're doing. So the key really is to ease into it and make conservative progressions in what you're doing. You have uh, an acronym FIT, F-I-T-T -T, mm -hmm. in this case. What do those uh, letters stand for and what is the principle behind it? Yeah, that's something we call the FIT principle and it applies to all of the different components of fitness. So the different components of fitness that we have are cardiorespiratory fitness, muscular fitness which consists of muscular strength and endurance, power, hypertrophy. And then we have balance and flexibility, uh, and body composition is considered a component of fitness as well. But the frequency, intensity, time, and type, that's the FIT principle, applies to all of those different components of fitness. So you can think of your activities related to the FIT principle. And of course, as you just mentioned a moment ago, sustainability of a program mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing of all. Mm -hmm. You have to get into a program that you will be able to stay with over the long run. Yeah. Speaking of running, uh, I yep. happen to be a 5K runner. I know mm -hmm. that you run 10Ks. I do. So we have a lot in common in uh -huh. that regard. And I know that uh, in my high school years, I mm -hmm. was involved in track and field. Mm -hmm. And then there were about 
I would say, two decades that went by where I was enjoying life but not mm -hmm. exercising. Mm -hmm. And I decided to get back into it because I realized that if I did get into a regular fitness program, it would make me feel more energetic yep. and allow me to feel healthier overall. Yep. And so one of the things that occurred to me as I got back into it was this is going to be a long haul. Mm -hmm. I can't expect to be competitive in 5K races in just a month or two. Right. It's going to take a while. And the yep. body has to adjust and adapt. Yep. Tell us about that process. Yeah, I was going to mention, this relates back to your question of, you know, what happens when people start and do too much too soon. So there's the physiological adaptations that have to take place. So your heart and your lungs, your cardiorespiratory system have to make the adjustment and get used to things. Your musculoskeletal system have to make the adjustment and get used to things. So your muscles have to make the adjustment, connective tissues, your joints, the bones. Um, but it also takes, going back to this holistic perspective, it also takes an adjustment in your social schedule. You're making changes and reallocating and dedicating your time. It takes a shift in your mentality because you're making this commitment into your running. And I think there's a spiritual component of it too that, that ties back in to it where you're making an adjustment as you're reallocating time, energy, and resources that kind of changes your outlook and your perspective. So it, it really takes the support of your family and others that are around you and then uh, it takes the support of your body making those adjustments over time as well. And we know yeah. that discipline is an important factor mm -hmm. and I think there is that spiritual component in discipline mm -hmm. that if you discipline your mind to get out there every day even if it, you know it might be raining out or maybe right. there's the wind blowing mm -hmm. or maybe you ate too much for dinner or something but you right. still have to discipline yourself to take care of business. Yes, I think that's a strong combination of the mental and the spiritual side of things and, and I find those interacting a lot in, in running especially I think but it could be in all different kinds of disciplines, yeah. And we've, it, there was a movie once called The uh, Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. That was the <laughs> title of the film. And yeah. so there is a certain loneliness to long distance sure. running, but it can also be a social event as well. Mm -hmm. If you go out with friends, join a running club, participate in 5K races on the weekend yep. and make friends that way. Talk about the intersection of the social component in an event that seems to be on the surface uh, a lonely event because of the long distance running. Yeah, I think just as you mentioned, you could join a running club and have the social fulfillment in that aspect where you're working out alongside of your friends. Maybe that's on your lower intensity day where you're doing a, a longer run, but you can have time to talk to your friends, interact in that way. And then you can also bring out the, the social competitive side too if you're registering for these races. You can kind of indulge the competitive side of yourself in a social environment in that way. So I think all of that ties back in with filling the social need as well as moving your body in a physical way. Right, well mm -hmm. let's talk about some of the basics of exercise such as the cardiovascular exercise, mm -hmm. also muscle strength and muscle toning. Yep. There's also flexibility and balance. Mm -hmm. Talk about how we need to integrate all of those into an effective uh, exercise program. You bet. The American College of Sports Medicine ACSM, uh, we'll use as the acronym, put out a position stand back in 2011 on the quantity and quality of physical activity necessary for healthy adults. And that would be, you know, kind of like the minimal requirements to maintain a healthy lifestyle as an adult. And they gave certain requirements for how much cardiorespiratory exercise to do, how much muscular fitness, how much balance, flexibility work that you should be doing on a regular basis. And so you should accumulate up to 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiorespiratory exercise per week or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week or a combination of the two. And we talked about in your running regime, you do a combination of the two. Some days are more moderate, some days are higher intensity for a nice combination. And then same as the case for muscular fitness, you should be getting about two or three days per week where you're working all of the major muscle groups of your body, doing two or three sets of eight to 10 repetitions. And the load is the key part. And the load that you choose should be just enough weight so that you can get up to eight repetitions, but probably not many more than 10. So it's gonna be a pretty decent amount of weight that you're moving or pushing. 
And then those recommendations kind of parallel for flexibility and balance. You should be doing two or three days per week, getting two or three sets of holding a stretch or a movement for between 10 and 30 seconds for every major muscle group of your body. So those are kind of the minimum requirements for staying healthy as an adult. Right, and going back to the concept of overdoing it, mm -hmm. uh, I know from my previous experience with weightlifting when I've mm -hmm. done that, that uh, you really only should lift every other day. You shouldn't lift every day because the muscles need time to recover and mm -hmm. they need that 48 hour stretch mm -hmm. to do that. Yes, especially at the beginning of your exercise program. You need to, to start small and give yourself, I recommend for folks that are just getting into muscular fitness or, or weight training, resistance training, 48 hours in between training muscle groups. So a nice way to do it is, let's say on Monday you did mostly leg exercises and you wanted to resistance train again on Tuesday, then you can do upper body and then wait and do legs again on Wednesday. So you're giving yourself adequate time to recover in between. And, and that's when we see progress, adaptation, muscle growth or adaptation to what we're putting on them. So oftentimes the downtime can be just as important as the, the exercise time because you need time for those muscles to rebuild. Absolutely. And I want to transition that thought into mm -hmm. talking about marathon running. Okay. Because you and I have had a discussion about this prior mm -hmm. to the taping mm -hmm. and um, marathons are not for everyone. No. Even those of us that are considered dedicated runners. Mm -hmm. I've had people ask me, Dave, I'm sure it's only a matter of time until you run a marathon. Right. And I've responded every single time, no, I'm never going to run a marathon because that's not going to work for me. I mm -hmm. know what my body's limitations are mm -hmm. and I know the amount of wear and tear that it would take not just to run the race, but the training to get ready for the right. race is more than I think I can handle. Mm -hmm. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? I, I love to tell people you have to find what works for you and your body because it is, it's, it's the taxation that you're going to be putting on your body, it's the time and energy and dedication that you're going to be putting into it. So you have to think about um, outside of just the physical side, can your schedule handle the dedicated training time that it's going to take as well? Some individuals are just so biomechanically sound that they could run for days and be fine. You and I have talked about that's not our biomechanic <laughs> standpoint. So we've kind of found our happy distance. And I, I would encourage folks to find their happy distance, not to feel like they have to just knock themselves down trying to do half marathons or marathons if they're getting persistent and recurring injuries that just don't go away. They get physical therapy and then it comes back. Maybe it's better for you to do a 5K or a 10K if you're consistently having iliotibial band or what we call IT band syndrome that's pretty common in runners, runner's knee, those types of issues, then maybe it's better to just pull back do a shorter distance uh, and what we were just talking about earlier is that in those shorter distances then maybe you can push a little faster of a time in the sprint of the 5k <laughs> exactly and the yeah. sustainability aspect is the key exactly we've got to take a break right now we'll be back in just a moment and when we do come back we'll talk about the mental stress of life and how we need to deal with that in order to be truly healthy stay with us there's a world of opportunity available through the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Does your career involve legal work, law enforcement, fraud investigation, or crime scene analysis? You can increase your skill level and enhance your career by enrolling in the Basic Applied Forensic Science and Crime Analysis Certificate Program. For more information, contact the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly at Cal State Long Beach. My guest today is Ayla Donlin. Ayla is the director of the Life Fit Center and she's also a faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology. And Ayla, when we went to the break, I mentioned mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about how to deal with mental stress and the spirituality side that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. as part of a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But first let's talk about something else that's also really important and that's diet because what we put into our bodies is going to definitely affect how we feel and how we perform if we are in an exercise program. Tell us a little bit about diet and how important it is. Yeah. 
I like to talk about it um, as nutrition because I think when we say the word diet it automatically implies like a restriction or a specified amount of food or type of food so I usually talk about it in terms of nutrition so I say exercise and nutrition and kind of what you were saying I tell folks think of food as fuel so you exercise and you use food as fuel for your exercise rather than I exercise so that I can eat. <laughs> you eat so you can exercise, not exercise so you can eat. So it's kind of flipping the switch a little bit. Um, and just like we talked about with exercise, I think with your nutrition, it takes finding a sustainable practice over time. That's why I don't think diet works because diet implies maybe a short regimen in a short amount of time, but nutrition is long-standing over time, something that's sustainable for you. What does a healthy, I won't say the word diet, what does a healthy <laughs> nutritional regimen consist of? Yeah, I think a great resource to go to is the choosemyplate.gov as kind of a foundation or the groundwork. Um, and I love how they put on the plate what your portion sizes should look like. So on your plate, your vegetables are going to take up the largest portion of your plate. Um, and then grains take up another big portion. And then you've got some left over for fruit and for protein. Um, and so I think of it in that way as, as I'm helping folks kind of plan out their meals to kind of think about as you're looking at your plate and as you're planning out your portions, plan it accordingly to that. Okay, and in terms of protein intake, this has become a raging debate of late. We have the paleo diet mm -hmm. and some other diets that mm -hmm. have been around for a while. Mm -hmm. What do you think about protein intake and what percentage of a person's nutritional intake that should uh, actually consist of? Yeah, I think it depends largely on your activity level. The more active you are, and specifically the more that you're engaging in muscular fitness types of activities, the more protein you should consume so that you can do the repair work that's necessary. So, so protein is a huge component for our re reparation. Um, and so consuming enough protein throughout the day is key in order for your muscles to rejuvenate and repair. So are carbohydrates, and I think people get the wrong message with that. It, we've kind of, as a society, I think, shunned carbohydrates. I want to make a shirt that says, I heart carbs, <laughs> <laughs> because they're a huge piece of the fueling and the repair work as well. So as far as like a percentage goes, I'd say roughly 40% of your diet should be carbohydrates and 20 to 25 percent should be protein. And then let's talk, we'll talk like pre-workout, post-workout. Probably post-workout is one of the most important times to be taking in your nutrients. And most science now is showing or demonstrating that a ratio of three to one of carbohydrates to protein is the appropriate intake post-workout. So you're refueling, putting the carbohydrate back in, and then you're putting protein in to do the repair work. What kinds of carbs are we, are we supposed to eat? Mm -hmm. Not the highly refined carbs that you see in like donuts, <laughs> 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 things like that. It should be whole grain. And the closer that you can get to kind of the raw grain, the better. Mm -hmm. So brown rice is great. Um, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat anything uh, is good. I like oats a lot, whole, whole grain oats. I really enjoy, so those would all be examples. You're not afraid of gluten. I'm not afraid of gluten. It, it sits well with me. I know for others um, that might have a gluten sensitivity, they need to you know, rethink what they're consuming from a carbohydrate perspective. Um, but I, th I think that's another area that's very popular right now as far as the anti-gluten movement. Um, and I think if, if you have a sensitivity to it or if you have celiac disease, then of course you have to be sensitive to gluten. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking it out unless you find that your body operates better without consuming much of it. Just for a moment, uh, we hear a lot about juicers and juicing machines mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the juicing phenomenon? Yeah, I think that can be a wonderful way to make a nutritional change. I prefer 
uh, a blender over a juicer. That's my preference because in a blender you're keeping all of the fibrous components of the food that you're putting in, the fruits and the vegetables largely. So you're getting all of the pulp, all of the good fibrous stuff that helps things move through you. And in, in the juice, um, it, it's still good, but you're not getting those fibrous components. Takes out some of that fiber, as you mentioned. Yeah, and, and the minerals and the vitamins, um, I think you can find to an, an even greater extent doing blending versus juicing as well, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that realm. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's get to what I mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. uh, dealing with mental stress mm -hmm. and the spiritual component of mm -hmm. uh, healthy living. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have had uh, some um, exposure to Reiki mm -hmm. in the Life Fit Center. Mm -hmm. And Reiki, from what I understand, is uh, a Japanese technique for relaxation mm -hmm. and for um, dealing with issues of stress mm -hmm. and for healing. Mm -hmm. What do you know about it? Yeah, I've really enjoyed learning more about it. It's from what I'm understanding of it, and I'm actually going to get level one Reiki certified coming up later in April, but it, it's about channeling the energy in your body to find a place of peace and of calm and that you can be in on your own and that you can share with others. I think that's just a beautiful philosophy in life, so finding a deep place of peace and content and love and joy within yourself and the energy of your body so that you can share that with other people. And that's essentially what Reiki is. Sometimes it's thought of as a healing art where you're putting your hands on or around another person to help in the energy sharing. Um, so there's, there's different ways that you can practice it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I happen to bring in some principles of Reiki mm -hmm. here and maybe we can talk about you these. And I'll read this very briefly. Mm -hmm. And here are the principles. Just for today, I will live the attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Just for today, I will not worry. Just for today, I will not anger. Just for today, I will do my work honestly. Just for today, I will show love and respect for every living thing. Does that pretty well encompass it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were the same five principles that were shared at our Introduction to Reiki workshop. And I really like that because, again, I think it's bringing in the holistic perspective and you're making the decision on a, on a daily basis. Just like you do in the discipline of your exercise, you make that decision on a daily basis that you're going to be dedicated to that. Same with nutrition. So I think it should be the same for our stress and relaxation. And I, I, like, I particularly like the attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. It's easy to take the opposite attitude. We've all been there. Yep. But uh, do we have to actually uh, convince ourselves to be grateful for things? I love this fact. It's a fact. It's scientifically proven that gratitude is the number one most easily self-generated positive emotion. So it's something that we can start to generate within ourselves by simply thinking about the things that we are grateful for. And I do think that it is a purposeful and cultivated attitude. So I think it, you know, it takes some effort, but it is the, the most easily self-generated positive emotion. So when people come to you Ayla and say, I'm so stressed out. I mm -hmm. just don't think I can do this. I can't mm -hmm. exercise because I just can't concentrate. I'm too stressed. What do you tell people like that? Yeah, I, I try to take a holistic look at it. So, you know, what's going on in your life that's causing these things? and how can we refocus it. Um, I, I really like, I'm reading a book right now called Before Happiness. It's by Sean Aker and he talks about mapping your life out based on your meaning markers and that could be a lot of different things but staying focused and remaining true to those meaning markers. Right now we could get distracted by so many different things in the world. There's so many things to spend your time, energy, and attention on. So if you can focus on the meaning markers, the most meaningful aspects of your life, then that can really focus you and I think can decrease stress a lot. And when we talk about things like yoga, that's mm -hmm. movement-based. Reiki is a little bit more relaxation-based, mm -hmm. but can we integrate all kinds of techniques to help us feel more relaxed? Absolutely. I think meditation is a wonderful practice and that's usually integrated into both yoga and Reiki. And you can do that on a, on a daily basis. A simple exercise would be just following your breath, breathing in and breathing out, and even counting your breath. So for 10 breaths, 
saying in your mind, I am breathing in, one, I am breathing out. And I think if you can just do that for 10 breaths, if you're feeling stressed out or overwhelmed, that's a nice way to kind of recenter yourself. And mm -hmm. so what we're really talking about is balancing mental well-being with physical well-being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it takes both to be balanced as a human being. Yeah. Exercise can also stimulate the brain, mm -hmm. and this is really important. And I think mm -hmm. the original concept of student-athlete was exactly that. You are mm -hmm. a student and you're an athlete, and one helps the other. You mm -hmm. can learn better if the brain is more stimulated. Exercise helps stimulate the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more research that's coming out, the more we're seeing evidence that movement exercise stimulates brain activity. And there's, there's so much research in that area right now and that's being published and coming out um, that it, it's just, it's so overwhelming that it's almost, for lack of a better term, a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that moving really does stimulate the activity and, it's, and it sustains, to use that word again, it sustains the longevity and quality of your brain life for longer. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about injuries mm -hmm. that occur as we exercise. Yep. And how do we learn to self-diagnose injuries and when do we actually need to get physical therapy? Yeah, that's such a key piece. If you're dealing with an injury, I think it's, you have to self-diagnose very cautiously. I think if you get to a point at which it's a persistent pain, um, so it's moved beyond just kind of a nagging discomfort and it's become a persistent pain, at that point, I would seek the consultation of a health professional. Maybe you'll start at, at your general physician and then get a referral to a physical therapist, or you could go straight to a physical therapist if you think it's an orthopedic issue that needs attention. So if it's around a joint, um, or if you feel like there's a, a muscle strain or issue in that realm, you could seek out a, a physical therapist as well. Yeah. Ayla, we've run out of time. Okay. Fast. But this has been terrific, and mm -hmm. I'm sure the viewers have learned a lot, and I've certainly learned a lot in today's discussion. Thanks again for joining us. Of course. Thanks, Dave. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another program. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.